Hello and welcome. We are so glad that you decided to tune in today to our June 6th service. We have a great service ready for you. Charlie Mashinder from BIC Church of Canada will be joining us and will be installing our new acting lead, Pastor Chris Higginson. We have a time of worship uh, from some of our own team and then we're gonna wrap it all up with a time of communion. So be sure to get that ready and prepped if you haven't yet. Welcome to Sabo Christian Fellowship. Before we get into service, we wanted to make you aware of a few things. As things start to open up, as meetings and programs and events start to become available, this is one way that you can find out what's going on. But please don't forget about our website, our social media places, and our weekly email that goes out. But for now, my name is Andy. This is the Weekly Update! We're doing our part to help you understand what church will look like for the next little bit. We know that it's confusing and unknown and full of what seems to be maybe riddles, but we are doing the research and the work so that you don't have to. And we also wanted to communicate to you what you can do for church in the next little while, not what you can't do. With the end of the stay at home order, there are new opportunities opening up to begin to regather. While our Sunday services will need to remain online at this point, we are now able to gather in groups of up to five outside. Soon it's going to be 10, but for now it's five. And if you have a way to watch the service outside, why not invite someone to join you uh, wherever you are? We also have reopened spaces in the church facility to be used for groups of up to 10 beginning immediately. So contact the church office and we can arrange a space for your group to meet. We have completed, edited, and published the second Steps of Faith Spiritual Discipline Study. It is now available online on our website, on YouTube, and Right Now Media. This is a great tool that you can use, either at your own pace or with a small group. For more information, please reach out to Ken Hawley. In relation to the idea of reopening, we are planning an outdoor worship event on June the 26th, so save the date, mark your calendars. For now, that's all the information we have, but again, mark your calendars, save the date. We're going to keep you informed as we move closer to that Saturday night. That is all the news and information for today. Stay tuned to all of our communication outlets for more information as it becomes available.
Good morning, my name is Charlie Mashiner and I am the Executive Director of Being Christ Church of Canada and it's my privilege to be able to be with you uh, today for a very special Sunday in the life of your congregation as you commission a new pastor for ministry. It would have been my preference to be with you obviously in person if I could have been today but uh, obviously because of the pandemic that's not possible and so uh, we're going to go ahead and I'm recording this today and also be recording uh, the um, commissioning rite or ritual which will be coming up next and then after we do these first two parts your pastor will have an opportunity to respond uh, to uh, to you as a congregation today and for you to welcome them into the life of your congregation so first of all let me uh, give you what is commonly called the charge to the congregation charge really means uh, uh, a sense of um, encouragement or a word of, uh, of instruction, a word of direction, uh, something that you would aspire to as a congregation in, as you begin this next season of life with your pastor. I'm going to keep my uh, remarks brief today, but let me just um, tell you that I want to talk about Genesis chapter 26 today. It's kind of an obscure passage for a commissioning service, uh, but let me give you some instruction about uh, what this might, um, might might mean, and you can draw some connections, I think, as I read this already in your mind. This is uh, Genesis chapter 26, verses 17 through to 22. So Isaac moved to the valley of Gerar, where he settled. He reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Esak, which means dispute or quarrel, because they disputed with him there. Verse 21, then they moved on and dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also, so he named it Sitna, which means opposition. He then moved on from there and dug yet another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, which means room, saying, now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in this land and in this place. May the Lord give us understanding of his word today. First of all, some background. It's obvious that you'll note in this passage how important a well is, uh, especially in many parts of the world today. Uh, a well is everything to the local community. It's a gathering point. It's a place of sustenance and nourishment. Obviously, you can't exist without, as a human being without a clean source of drinking water. And it's also essential to the agricultural life of the community because the animals have to have a source of drinking water as well. Isaac was going to become a very wealthy man and he had large flocks and many animals that would require uh, the, uh, the well to have a source of, of water. And so finding a good well was a very important thing as Isaac began to move into this new place that God instructed him to go. There was a famine. Uh, a drought in the world at that time and uh, he was tempted to go to Egypt the scripture says uh, but God instructed him very clearly to stay in this place where he was going to be settling called Gerar. The people that lived in Gerar were uh, Philistines was the Philistine nation which were largely the locals that lived there and you can imagine if you were moving to a new place there's already people there living where you are so you're moving uh, to this place and you're hoping that you receive a warm welcome when you get there. Unfortunately, uh, that was not what Isaac experienced when he moved to Gerar. At first, there seemed to be a bit of a welcome there. The king, in fact, of the Philistines welcomed him in and, um, and treated him well and, um, and had him over <laughs> for, uh, for a meal. Uh, but that's about as far as it went. And, and as Isaac began to prosper in the land, um, people began to get threatened uh, by him and the welcome soon disappeared. It says he went, uh, they went so far as to start filling in the wells of places where his herds were going to uh, receive water and where his people were going to, to be. And so this is a nomadic culture. People would move around. And so these wells um, were being filled in ahead of him. It was uh, a very unhospitable thing to do. And so Isaac uh, goes to this place, uh, the first place, and he opens the well and uh, begins to feed his flock and then the neighbors the locals come out and say uh, you can't settle here you can't have this water you can't have this well this is our well this is our water and um, and Isaac gets the distinct feeling that they don't want him there and so rather than causing a dispute he uh, decides to move on and he names this place Esek which means dispute or quarrel 
He moves on a little farther and goes to a second place and does the same thing, and the exact same thing happens again. He gets the same kind of treatment. He opens the well, begins to feed his flocks, begins to set up uh, a home there, and uh, these people say, you're not welcome here either. And so instead of having a dispute with them and a fight with them, he doesn't want to pick a fight with people that were already there first, he, uh, he decides uh, to move, move on. And this place was, uh, he named Sitna, which means opposition. He moves on to the third place, and in that place does the exact same thing, opens up the well and uh, tries to, to begin to make a home there. And it says he did in fact find a home there. And he names this place Rehoboth, which means room. And he says this, the Lord has given us room and we will flourish here. So what does this have to do with a commissioning service for a new pastor? Well, you've likely already figured it out. Uh, our prayer, my prayer for you as a congregation, is that uh, you would make a welcome uh, for your new pastor and that your church, your spiritual community, would be known as a place of welcome, as a place that has room for people. And that would be demonstrated in the way that you welcome in your pastor. You know, when people come into a congregation, I believe they can sense. It's like almost like a feeling that you get when you come into a place. Um, that you sense if these people really like each other or if there's a welcome uh, for me there, if, I could, if I'm going to feel accepted and welcome into that community. And I believe it's such a contagious kind of thing that draws people into the community almost before they hear a message or hear the singing or anything else. Uh, they sense if there is a welcome there for them. My prayer is that your church would be a place where people feel when they come through the doors of wherever you're meeting, that they would feel like they've come home spiritually and that there is a welcome waiting for them there where they can hear a life-changing message and experience a life-changing relationship with the Lord Jesus. My prayer is that you would welcome your pastor into the life of your congregation in exactly the same way that those newcomers feel that uh, they want to be welcomed, that they would, uh, your pastor would experience the grace of your community. No pastor is perfect. Uh, let me tell you that, and no congregation is perfect, of course, as well. But your pastor will work hard and try hard and be a shepherd to you. They will share in some of the most important life events with your community and um, create memories with you that will last a lifetime. And so my prayer, again, today is that you would welcome the pastor into the life of your congregation and they would seek to be a good shepherd to you as a fellowship, that they would work hard in the work of ministry. But as a congregation, you would pray for them, you would encourage them, you would support them, you would cooperate with them, you would treat them like a human being and cut them some slack when they make a mistake. And in doing that, I believe this partnership, this cooperation between your pastor and your congregation will create an environment for the church to flourish, where God will bless your church and cause it to grow and people will be drawn to the message of Jesus Christ that's being lived out in community among your people. That you would be a Rehoboth congregation, a congregation of room. And so that's my challenge to you today. Pastors in the BIC church serve really in uh, a dual role. They're working under the auspices and leadership of the denomination. We credential our pastors, we support them in ministry, we encourage them, we uh, provide systems uh, to make sure they're looked after, but really ultimately they also work in the context of the local church and it's there that they find their primary source of fellowship, encouragement, and service. And so today as a denomination we are cheering you on in your new start in this new season when you welcome a new pastor into your congregation and we're praying God's blessing on you today that you might experience just a wonderful new season as you move into the season of your pastor's leadership. God bless you today and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing in the um, commissioning ritual which will follow right after this and I'm going to record that on Zoom separately. So thank you for having me with you today. And then after we do that, your pastor will come to respond. God bless you and thank you for having me by way of video today. Amen. Hello again, Sabal uh, Christian Fellowship Church family. We're so glad that uh, we can be together virtually today. I wish I could be there with you in person uh, to share in this time of commissioning. 
uh, for Pastor Chris and Jane. And uh, but uh, this is the way we'll do it for today. Uh, we're excited for this new season that you're moving into, and excited uh, that Chris has uh, felt God's call to come uh, to Sable for this time. And uh, we just want to uh, come around them today and enter into this time of commissioning. And uh, if I was there in person with you, I'd be asking for you to participate in a response. Um, I'm going to assume that you can do that at home uh, today. And then I have some questions for Christian Jean as well. And then we'll have a time of uh, prayer uh, and uh, we'll conclude this part. And I think Chris is going to come and respond uh, after we uh, do this part. Let me read this for you today. Ephesians chapter four. Uh, this is some selections from Ephesians four. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ saw fit. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Today, we join together to recognize the calling of God of Chris Higginson as acting senior pastor of Salvo Christian Fellowship. We believe this appointment has been directed by the Lord and so it is fitting that pastor and congregation give recognition of their commitment to each other for the building up of God's church. First of all, this charge to the congregation. To those who are regularly part of the life of Salvo Christian Fellowship, I give you this charge. My brothers and sisters, having called Chris Higginson to be the pastor of your fellowship, will you pledge both he and his wife, Jean, your support, your encouragement, and enabling by prayer as together they serve among you? If so, please answer together heartily, we will. And if you're at home, you can say, we will. Will you covenant with Chris to be attentive to the preaching of God's word, to work together to build this church, and to follow Chris's leadership as he strives to follow Christ? If so, please answer together, we will. And then finally, will you receive Chris and Jean into your hearts and into your homes? counsel with them, encourage them, and walk together with them in a spirit of Christian unity and fellowship? If so, please answer together, we will. Thanks for your participation. And now the charge to the pastor and to their spouse. Chris, having been invited to be the pastor of Sable Christian Fellowship, do you take these people to be your people and this place of ministry to be your calling for this season of your life? If so, please answer, I do. I do. Do you covenant to give yourself faithfully to the ministry of the word and to prayer, to give spirit-led leadership to this fellowship, and to care for these people and nurture them in the ways of Christ, and to carry a concern for how this church might reach out into the community and reach people with the good news of Jesus? If so, please answer, I do. I do. Do you covenant to walk together in Christian fellowship with these people, forgiving as you expect to be forgiven, striving to keep your heart and mind centered on Christ and to keep growing in your calling as a pastor? If so, please answer, I do. I do. Jean, the call of God to Chris is also God's calling on you and you share in that calling. Will you join in this covenant that Chris has declared today and partner with him in the ministry and strive to use your gifts to build up uh, this congregation? If so, please answer, I will. I will. Chris, having been called to this ministry by God in the leadership of our denomination and this local church, Sable Christian Fellowship, I declare you to be the pastor of this church. May both you and this congregation flourish and be blessed as you work together in this season of ministry. God bless you. Let me pray. Father, we thank you today uh, for the way you've been working uh, in Sable over these last number of years. And Lord, um, there's been twists and turns, and we don't always understand the way uh, that you're leading, but we believe you're good, and you lead us forward. And we just thank you today for bringing Chris and Jane uh, to, back to Sable for this season of their lives and for this uh, time in the life of the, of the fellowship. We just believe this has been your leading and your direction. I pray that you would just uh, help the congregation to make room for them, and to welcome them in and bless them. And may they just journey and grow together and flourish together as they learn what it means to follow Jesus together. Father, thank you uh, for Salva Christian Fellowship. Thank you that it's a lighthouse 
uh, on the Huron shoreline. And I pray that um, in days and weeks and months ahead, as we come out of this pandemic, uh, and uh, Sobel has a great new facility, uh, we pray that uh, we would hear story after story of um, the way the church is making an impact in the community, of the way people are learning to care for each other and support each other and encourage each other, of the way people are growing in their faith. And Father, I pray that you would just bless Chris and Jean in this ministry and they just would sense your anointing and your protection and your blessing. As we pray for them today, we also pray uh, for Pastor Dave and pray, continue to pray for his healing as well. And thank you for uh, what you've been doing for him and in his life lately and for his uh, support and partnership in the gospel as well. Father, we thank you today for this new start and we just pray a great blessing on Chris and Jean today. Um, Lord, in the difficult times and the low times, I pray that you would encourage them and bring people along that would just cheer them on. And then, Lord, uh, may there be many wonderful times of memories being made and successes being won that uh, we can celebrate together. So we just thank you, Lord, that you're faithful to us, that you help us at every turn when we don't know what to do. I pray you just give Chris an unusual anointing as he speaks your word week after week. And just watch over them as a family and bless them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
perfect life. You are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son of God. You are Jesus, Son of God. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my troll He's at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a This is my coffee mug, and that's not my only coffee mug. It just happens to be the one that I used this morning. It's quite a lovely coffee mug. This one actually came from a very nice pottery store in St. Jacob's. But my typical morning routine is that uh, I get up, and then job number one, feed the cat. Job number two is make coffee, and I do this every morning. Uh, well, there was one morning a couple of weeks ago when Jean actually got up first, and she was the one that made the coffee, but that's only because uh, rock smashes scissors, and there's a story to that I won't get into, but I love my morning coffee. But for the last year and a bit, having a coffee has meant a lot more to me than, uh, than usual. And so for the last year and a bit, every coffee that I drink, whether it's uh, something I brew at home or Amici's or Timmy's or Starbucks or whatever. Having a coffee is a call to prayer. And I pray for Pastor Dave. Having a coffee for me is a call to prayer. It's a trigger to pray for Dave. And it makes sense to me because Dave is a coffee guy. I don't want to say that Dave is a coffee snob, um, but I had a conversation with somebody from here just um, like last week. And he described Dave as a coffee connoisseur. And, and a coffee connoisseur, I think, is much like a coffee snob, just without the, the obnoxious, uh, elitist kinds of attitudes that go with it. But I have a coffee, and I pray for Dave, and I pray for Lisa, and I pray for the kids. And I pray specifically for healing for Dave. And I pray for healing and a return to pastoring Sobel Church. That's my prayer. That's my preferred outcome. That's my hope that Dave pastor the church. And I've been really clear about that with, with everybody, uh, including the board and the search team and certainly with Dave himself. Dave is a very, very important person to me. Um, he's my pastor and he's my friend and um, he's been my boss. And were it not for Dave, I would not be in ministry today. Were it not for Dave, um, Blue Water Church in Concordon likely would not exist. I had hoped that Dave would again be my boss uh, someday. In fact, he and I have had uh, different conversations in the last few years about what would it look like when I finish at Blue Water to come back here and work under Dave's leadership in helping uh, with his vision for site development, satellite uh, campuses, and so on. So, you know, I'm right where I want to be. But I'll be honest, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but in the midst of the joy of being here, there is some disappointment. In the midst of the excitement to get started, there is some sadness. And um, so I pray. I pray for Dave, I pray for healing, I pray for him to come back and lead the church. Uh, but until then, I will be the acting lead pastor. And when I first heard that title, I thought, oh, that's perfect, because I've always kind of wanted to be an actor. And then uh, somebody explained to me, no, 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 that's not what it is. You actually have to do the job. And um, I just want you to know, friends, that I will steward this role the best that I can. 
in full cooperation with Jesus, because it is his church, and in leaning a lot on Dave. Um, I expect to consult with Dave, and I already have this week, I've reached out to him for information, and he's sent me things, and uh, I want to be really collaborative with him, and he's, he's agreed uh, to that. Let me give you kind of an example of what that collaboration might, might look like. For instance, like during the month of May, as I was preparing uh, to come on board here, I was thinking to myself and praying about what, what is the first sermon series going to be uh, right out of the gate? What should that be? And I had some ideas. I thought, I, I thought of some things. And, and I think maybe some of them were half-decent ideas, but none of them were like, yeah, that's the one. And then I heard Dave say this. You remember Forward Together? What was the campaign title for our building project? Let's pull that out and use it again. Forward Together. Let's cling to that. Let's cling to each other. Cling to the, to the Lord's work here at Sabal. On one hand, very difficult days. On the other hand, exciting days. Filled with hope and anticipation of what's coming. Let's go Forward Together. Are you with me? And when I heard Dave say that, it was like, oh, uh, all of a sudden, that's it. Forward together. But where? What's the destination? Because as Dave mentioned, uh, forward together was the theme for the building uh, project. And uh, let me just say, Sobel Church, uh, looking around this building, awesome. What, a, what an awesome building. You did a great job. And uh, to accomplish something like this in the midst of very difficult circumstances, way to go. That's an amazing thing. So forward together, but, but where? What's the destination? And then, and then Ken picked up on this theme last Sunday and talked about forward together, talked about unity, and I got even more excited uh, about this theme. So I'm totally going to piggyback on what uh, Dave is thinking and where Ken was going uh, last Sunday. But still, this thing of forward together where what's the destination that was just kind of dogging me i didn't want it to be like the old story that you're probably uh familiar with of the airline pilot who's flying the passenger plane and uh, the plane's full of people and he comes on the pa system and he says uh, uh ladies and gentlemen uh this is your captain speaking and uh, he says i've got some good news and i've got some bad news he says the good news is that uh, flying conditions are beautiful. The skies are clear. We're cruising at an altitude of 36,000 feet. And uh, there's even a slight tailwind, so we're making excellent time. But the bad news is that all of our navigational equipment is broken and we have absolutely no idea where we're going. We don't want that. Forward together, where? And I read uh, or reread, I suppose, from 1 John chapter 4 last week. Um, some really significant words that uh, John says. Beginning at verse 16, here's what he says. We know how much God loves us. We know. That word is gnosko. It's an experiential knowledge. It's not just theory. It's not just John saying, hey, I read something somewhere. I've got this information. Uh, no, this is, we know, we've experienced how much God loves us. It's changed our world. It's rocked our lives. We know it. And he says to such an extent that we've put our trust in his love. And this word love that he's using here is agape. You've probably uh, heard that Greek term for love before. It's the most profound kind of love. Agape is the love with which God loves us. It's a love that is sacrificial. It's a love that is unconditional. It's a love that places value on the one being loved at our own expense. It's, a, it's, it's the kind of love that is a choice. It's a decision. It's an act of the will and not a feeling. That's the love that God has for us. That's the love that John has experienced to such an extent that they've put their trust in God's agape. And then he goes on and he says, God is love. And all who live in love live in God. That makes sense because if God is love, you live in love, you live in God. And God lives in them. Verse 17, and as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. Our love grows more perfect. That's, a, that's an odd 
statement. It's an odd phrase. Like, I always thought, isn't something either perfect or it's not perfect? How can something become more perfect? Well, the word that John uses for perfect is the word telos. And the word telos is not so much about whether something is perfect or imperfect, like flawless or flawed in some way. It's a word that speaks of destination, of of final destination. And you can think of it this way. Like if you were going to take a day trip, say you wanted to go to the grotto. Most uh, most people who live in Grey Bruce are familiar with what the grotto is. Maybe you've been there. Um, so say you wanted to go to the grotto. What you might do is you might head up uh, this way and go to Hepworth and then head north on number six and uh, in the direction of the grotto. And every kilometer that you drive, you are becoming more tell us. You're becoming closer and closer to the final destination, which is the grotto. And so you get to Clavering and you're more tell us. You get to Wyerton, you're even more tell us, closer to the destination. You get to Mar, you get to Ferndale, and uh, what's next? Um, like uh, Miller Lake, and then all of a sudden you're getting closer to Tobamori, even more tell us, more perfect, closer to that final destination. Then you see the sign for the grotto and you drive in the laneway and you get to the parking lot. And as long as you've booked like five years in advance, uh, you can park in the parking lot. Some of you who are local know about that frustration. Then you you walk down that trail of, what is it, a kilometer or two, and then you're at the grotto. That's perfect tell us. You finally arrived at the destination. And so what John is saying in verse 17 is our love grows more perfect. Our love grows more telos, more like the final destination. And the final destination he's talking about is agape. It's God's love, that that sacrificial, unconditional love that places value on the other at cost to ourselves. In fact, he says God is love back in verse 16. He said that God is love. You know, if one of your friends, maybe a family member, a neighbor, whatever, who doesn't follow Jesus but who knows you're a Jesus follower, If they say to you sometime, hey, what is God? You could give no answer more simple, yet more profound and theologically astute and accurate than simply to say, God is love. That's his DNA. That's that's who he is. Love is. Love is the only thing that the scripture teaches that God is. He is love. Now, some of you might be thinking, Chris, I think you're forgetting about the fact that the apostle Peter said some things, like he said, God is holy. Peter also said that God is grace. I haven't forgotten about that. I know about that. But think of it this way. Think about eternity past, before the creation of the the heavens and the earth, before certainly the creation of, of you and me. In eternity past, when it was just God dwelling together, Father, Son, and Spirit in triune unity, dwelling together in relational love, relational oneness, when it was just God in eternity past, the only thing that you could say that God is, is love. In eternity past, you couldn't say that God is holy because holiness is a relational concept. Holiness means to be set apart. And in in eternity past, you could not say that God is holy because there was none unholy from whom to be set apart. Similarly, in eternity past, when it was just God, Father, Son, and Spirit, you could not say that God is grace because grace, too, is a relational concept. Grace means undeserved favor. And in eternity past, when it's just God, there was none undeserving who needed favor from God. In eternity past, you can only say that God is love. Everything else that God says, everything else that God does comes from his love. His holiness is an expression of his love. His grace is an expression of his love. Even his wrath ultimately is an expression of his love. That's a sermon for another day, but um, love is his DNA. And so as the life of God, the God who is himself love, as his life is lived out in us and through us, and as our love becomes more tell us, more and more closer to resembling what his love is like, we're getting closer to the destination. The destination is love, God's love, most fully, most um, accurately seen in Jesus Christ. 
demonstrated nowhere more clearly than at the cross. John goes on to say in verse 18, he says, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. So as our, uh, as our love, as our capacity to express agape love, as our love becomes more and more telos, more and more like God's love, the more and more, John says, that it expels anxiety and expels fear from our lives. And if, if we're honest, I think we would all probably say that these last many months, these last 15 months for sure, there's been times of anxiety. Maybe for you, there's been times of some fear. I think for all of us, this pandemic has, has kind of knocked us uh, off kilter a little bit. Our equilibrium kind of got jostled around a little bit in the midst of this pandemic. And what expels fear and anxiety in our lives is this love of God that is developed and cultivated and then lived out through us in increasing measure. It expels or it casts out fear. Um, that's an interesting phrase, expels. It's the same phrase that is used of Jesus in the Gospels where he expels unclean spirits from people. So you can, you can have an exorcism of fear and an exorcism of, of anxiety as our love grows more and more like the love of God. One of the, one of the kind of hard truths, I guess, and, and this, this is um, a generally true statement that I will make. Uh, there are exceptions to it, very notable exceptions, but when we feel fear and when we feel anxiety and when we feel like our equilibrium is kind of off kilter, it's usually because our focus is inward. It's on ourselves. That's not always the case because there are some who feel fear and anxiety and it's biological. Uh, and it's not their fault. They really can't help it. But for the rest of us, um, that anxiety and fear is, is generally because our focus is inward. But as the love of God becomes more telos, more, uh, as our love more resembles the love of God, um, it frees us. It frees us up to focus on others. And these are days where we must focus on others. We must focus on others in creative way uh, to express this love that we're talking about. I've, I've kind of gone on too long here this morning. Let me just say this. Gene and I are, we're very humbled, delighted, honored uh, to be able to be here among you, to serve Jesus alongside of you. We've been so uh, welcomed. We've received uh, text messages and phone calls and cards, and, um, and people have just been very kind welcoming us. And I'm looking forward to next Sunday already, when we're going to begin this new teaching series called Forward Together in Love. Forward Together in Love, where love is both the means and the end, where love is both the way that we travel and it is also the destination to which we are headed. And I think this really is at the heart of know God, become like Jesus, and change our world. Like John writes, we know how much God loves us. We've know, we know it experientially. This God who is himself love as we grow more and more telos in our love, as our love more and more resembles God's love, then we're becoming like Jesus. Because Jesus, the scripture tells us, is the exact representation of the Father. And Jesus said in John 13, I give you a new commandment that you, what? Love one another. How? As I have loved you. And he says, by this, by this one thing, by our love, people will know that we are followers of Jesus. That's how we change our world. We will not change our world in the direction of love by our judgment. We will not change our world in the direction of love by pounding away on what it is that we're against. We will not change our world in the direction of love with our political ideologies. We will not change our world in the direction of love with our pandemic ideologies. It's forward together in love. And I think as we're focused on the love of God revealed in Jesus, seen nowhere more clearly than at the cross, this is a really appropriate 
morning to receive the Lord's Supper, to celebrate that. And in a few moments, Andy's going to lead us in that. So friends, forward together in love. God bless you. See you next week. As we move into a time of communion today, allow me to share a little bit, partly to give you time to gather the elements if you need to, and partly to help you prepare your heart and your mind for this moment right now. As I was preparing, this thought occurred to me that maybe I need to take time and either A, help people learn and be taught a little bit, or B, maybe be reminded and encouraged to think of this whole idea again. Because sometimes we get in a rut. Sometimes we get into this habit and we forget the importance and the significance of what we are doing in this moment of communion. And so what is communion? What is this thing that we do with bread and juice or maybe crackers or whatever you have at home? Well, if we take a moment and we trace back to where it comes from, it doesn't start at the Last Supper with Jesus and the disciples. It actually starts way before then. You see, that moment, Jesus and his guys were celebrating the Passover, a meal that the Jewish people celebrated every year to help remind them of the freedom that they experienced. Freedom from slavery, freedom from oppression, freedom that was provided and produced miraculously from God. It was a moment that they stopped and they remembered and they repented and they celebrated the freedom that they were given. If you've been a Christian for a while, do those words sound familiar? It should. And then Jesus comes along and he teaches a brand new way of thinking. One that says, you don't have to do all these things to be accepted. You don't have to be so strict with your laws. You don't have to wait once a year to celebrate. He says you have to love God and love others. He says that you have to believe in him if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. He says that the rules have changed. He says it's no longer once a year. It's every time you break bread. It's every time you gather. It's every time you meet and share a meal. Every time, remember what he, being Jesus, has done. So today we stop and we remember the freedom that he provided. Freedom from slavery, freedom from oppression, freedom from sin. Even as I was preparing this, I got stuck and I thought, I really haven't been a slave, but then God stopped me right away and he says, what about your habits that turn into addictions? What about when you just have to do something because it's a habit, which is sometimes a nice way of saying addiction? And I stopped and said, you're right. I mean, of course he's right. He's God. But how many times have I felt trapped? How many times have I felt a slave to the need, to the desire, to the addiction of whatever? And I wanted to escape, but I couldn't. And, and just so we're clear, addictions are not always just alcohol and drugs. Addictions can revolve around money and food and entertainment and people. You name it, whatever. When we get to the point in our life that we just can't live without something, we become a slave to it. When a habit or behavior or thought controls us, we become a slave to it. And here's the good news. Jesus came to free us from that slavery. Jesus came, lived, and died, and rose again to rescue us from that life. That is why we celebrate communion. Just like the Israelites celebrated their freedom from their past, from their slavery, from their bondage, we celebrate the freedom that Jesus provided. So today, as you spend time where you are, remember, reflect, and rejoice in the freedom that Jesus has provided. There will be instructions and scripture verses on the screen to help you navigate through this time. Feel free to pause the video if you need more time. There will be a countdown to help you out as well to be aware of how much time is left. But again, if you need more time, just simply pause the video.
Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so glad that you did. We are excited and looking forward to seeing you again as soon as we begin to open up. But in the meantime, will you join with me as I pray this prayer? God, this morning we come to you and we say for your goodness and generosity in giving us all that we need, help us to praise you. In every circumstance of life, in good times and in bad, help us to trust you. God, in love and faithfulness with all that we have and all that we are, help us to serve you. As we speak or write or listen to those nearby and far away, help us to share your love. God, in our plans and work for ourselves and for others, help us to glorify you. In every thought and word and deed, by the power of your Holy Spirit, this week, God, may we live for you. We praise all in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you again next week. Have a great time.